Casey Neistat often shoots super wide, 10 to 14 millimeters. Becky and Chris shoot long at 105. Peter McKinnon, Lizzie Pierce, Peter Lindgren, all at 24 millimeters. You'll usually see me at 85. Your lens choice when shooting a video will cause the biggest change in how everything looks. Way more than which camera you use and maybe on par with what type and what style of lighting you're using. Let's look at a few examples and I'll match them up with things you're used to seeing. We'll start out wide. Super, super common is the 24 millimeter lens. I could be wrong about these shots. Photographers are a sneaky bunch, but I'm probably not. Starting out with Peter McKinnon. He shoots his talking head shots wide. Notice how you can see a lot of the background as in more than one of the walls in whichever room he's in, which he changes up constantly, probably a good tip. I don't know. Fairly often, he's even holding the camera, but when he's not, you can catch him making adjustments on the fly. And that makes it clear that the camera is just two or three feet in front of him, hence probably 24 millimeters. He's almost always lit Rembrandt style, which is what I've got going on here, where he's using a large light source off to one side. The 24 millimeter has become a super common talking head lens for when it's personality that drives the video, rather than information or the story. Casey Neistat, when he's in his studio, is another wide angle, I'm guessing 24 millimeter shooter. You can see most of his office most of the time, and he's always sort of fussing with the camera, zooming it in or out or adjusting the angle. He has his camera really low on a table in front of him, so he's looking down at it. He'll occasionally switch to a super wide view. This is maybe 10 millimeters, and he's lit almost globally from every direction. He switches up his camera angle and focal length constantly so that a shot never goes stale, but he stays really wide. When he's outside, he's using auto ISO. And you can tell because when he changes from dark to light, the camera auto adjusts, but his motion blur stays the same and the plane of focus doesn't change either. Those two would be controlled by shutter speed and aperture. Becky and Chris. When they're in their studio, in front of one of their mini, sometimes temporary sets, they often like a long lens. This is at least 100 millimeters, and you can tell because even though you can see both of them, they definitely cannot reach out and touch the camera, and you'd only see like eight feet of the wall behind them. This would mean that their camera is positioned something like 20 feet in front of them, and its focal plane is super narrow. If we go back to Casey for a second, you can see all three walls of the room behind him. You can see like 40 linear feet of wall in the background of his shot. When you use a longer lens, like Becky and Chris are doing, you only need to dress up a little portion of the wall that's behind you. And that's actually what they do a lot, build these little sets to talk in front of that match the story that they're telling. But a lot of times, for instance, this one is just a wall that's on wheels that they just built up for this one video. Actually, I think it was a series of videos. I shoot more closely to these two. I love the look of a long lens. This shot here is at 85 millimeters and the camera is like 15 feet in front of me. And since it's a narrow focal length, even though I'm in this really large space, I'm in a warehouse and the back wall is another 20 feet behind me, 30 feet behind me. There's another 80 feet of disgusting warehouse wall and just stacks of equipment that you don't get to see in this shot. But I roll up a tool chest and some baskets full of lights behind it, and I put some color on the roll-up door back there, and that's it. If I move the camera even closer, so it's just a tight shot of my head and shoulders, the background will practically disappear into just amorphous colors and shapes. But if I shoot this same set through a super wide angle like Casey Neistat does, now you have access to all this crap in every direction. The room certainly does look larger, but I think it makes my face look a little round and kind of weird. To each their own. Casey and Peter have this entire room that they've carefully curated to look a certain way. And when you watch their videos, you have access to that whole room. I have an utter mess in every direction except for what's directly behind me. In between the telephoto shots of Becky and Chris and the wide shots of Peter and Casey, newer Lizzie Pierce videos look like she's using either a 35 or a 50 millimeter lens. It's still wide-ish, but you're only seeing 10 to 12 feet of her back wall. And even though she doesn't appear to be that far away from the back wall, there's a really soft look to it. I'm gonna put this at 50 millimeters f1.4. And if you look closely, it looks like she's using a ring light just above her and to her left, stage right. If you wanna be able to figure out what sort of lighting someone's using, take a look at their eyeballs. You can get a super good reflection off someone's eye of the light source or sources that they're using. Zooming into Peter, you can see a big soft box. Looking at Casey, you can't see his eyes obviously because of his sunglasses, but you can see that he's sitting in front of a big window, which is why he's totally evenly lit from all sides. That's not always the most flattering light, but at least there's a lot of light. Tony and Chelsea Northrup choose to light evenly from both sides, or maybe there's one kind of right in front and the one to the side. You can see the catch light, that's what the light in someone's eye is called, is way smaller in her eyes than with Peter McKinnon or even with Lizzie who's using a ring light, which are generally not very big by themselves. If you look closely at her eyeballs, you'll see the two lights. Since her eyeballs are round and the camera's right in front of her, you can see that one light is basically centered and the other light is off to the side. I think Tony and Chelsea are either using a hard light, like a light with no diffusion, that would be why her forehead looks shiny, or the lights are just really bright and pretty far away from their faces. My light's about three feet wide, but it is like, eh, four feet away from my face, so my 
catch light might look a little small too. A light with less diffusion or a light that's further away will cause harsher shadows and sometimes shiny skin if you're a little sweaty or oily. Totally a personal choice. Then again, they upload at 60 frames per second, which has always made me feel a little weird. Matty Hapoja, looking like a big softbox. Here he is at probably 20 millimeters. Lots of background wall space. And then here he is at probably 50 millimeters. Very little of the wall behind him showing. Peter Lindgren's shooting at 24 millimeters. And I think he's got his light kind of high into the side, which causes his eyes to be in the shadow of his hat some of the time. This shot catches a reflection of the softbox on his glasses, and you can see the grid pattern on the light. Peter's using that to ensure that the light only hits him and then falls off to the wall that's out of frame. Keep the rest of the room very dark to highlight his very moody LED lighting he's using. I'm also a fan of moody dark lighting, and that's the way I have my other studio set up. A light with a pretty steep angle to one side and then a dark background. Except again, I'm at 85 millimeters for this shot so that you can only see a little bit of that room because I'm a mess. Here's the rest of the room from a wider angle. Peter Lindgren is definitely shooting at a very wide open aperture, f1.4 or maybe even f1.2. You can see that the focus falls off even at his own shoulder, which is like a couple inches back from his face. And the background is just completely out of focus even though he's on a wide angle lens. You can see three of those walls. And all this is true for more than just talking head YouTube shots, of course. The same with photography. If you're setting up a portrait of someone and you're trying to design what the overall photo is gonna look like in the end, the difference of the final shot is gonna be so massive depending on your lens choice. I was out at Epcot at Disney World with my wife and I had my camera and a couple of lenses with me. First at 24 millimeters, which is similar to like the default lens on an iPhone. And tons of people take this exact picture with Spaceship Earth all lit up in the background. And this photo does tell that story, but it looks like a snapshot. You can see it back there, but this picture and this picture were taken with her standing in the exact same spot at the exact same time. I just put on a longer lens and then I backed up so that she would be the same size in the shot, but the background would be massively zoomed in. A longer lens will pull the background closer to you as you back up and zoom in. It's a weird effect. You can see it happening live in the Jaws uh, dolly zoom. So Sarah taking up the same amount of the frame in both of these shots, but this is at 24 millimeters and this is at 200 millimeters. Both telling the same story, but the telephoto version is much more dramatic and to me, it's more interesting. Same principle happens in the studio. If you move the camera back while zooming in the lens, you get the same size subject, but the background zooms way in. The background gets huge. Use this to shape and finish your shot to your liking.